So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and great, great honor to see you all here. And uh, <clears throat> you probably are attracted by the title in the pursuit of happiness, right? That's what you read. So, do we know what is happiness? We identify happiness with good feeling. That's usual, right? Yes. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with that. What is really important to see where that happiness comes from, how it is maintained, and how it goes away. Everybody has a bad day sometimes, right? Sure. Why? What makes it a bad day? You are grumpy, grouchy, you don't feel like working, and uh, you just don't want to do things you usually do. The feeling is different. In Korean, kibun. And when the, your kibun, your feeling is not good, then you are unhappy. And there's something really interesting about happiness. Sometimes we can be happy alone. Especially in America, whole society and whole system is geared for individual happiness. And not just in this country, but anywhere in the world, that's what's not working. I would like you to take a very close look at individual happiness and how limited it can be, what we really need to feel individually happy. And we need a lot of media, we need a lot of entertainment, and that's why this country is all about smiles and entertainment and good sensory perceptions. And is we are really heavily dependent on sensory data, sensory impressions for our individual happiness. In an original community, what we used to have in the Orient, it used to be different. There was not so much entertainment. But still, people held together and they were happy with simple and clear life. For most of them, it was not enough. So when the Western societies started to expand and uh, got into the Orient about 150 years ago, they started to transform the East. And then the idea of individual happiness came up also over there. But the real question is, how does that really work? How does individual happiness work? And if you realize how limited yourself, your ego is, just as limited your individual happiness is. So the main message for today's talk, and not just for today's talk, is Together, we can be a lot more happy than just alone, okay? So if you are pursuing happiness, then try to make not yourself happy primarily, but people around you. Those people who are your family, your friends, and if you really do this consistently, then you will also try to make your enemies happy. Because that's really important. Uh, because that's what takes enmity away. So, if you are about making yourself happy, that will not work. If you try to really help other people and ensure their happiness, that will make everybody else happy. And through that, your own happiness will come naturally. Uh, you, they used to ask a lot of great teachers, what is the difference between heaven and hell? And one of them had a very interesting response. Imagine you have a very large table full of gorgeous food, fantastic food. But all the utensils are too long. All the forks and spoons and everything else is too long and it's tied to your lower arm. So no matter how much you try to feed yourself, it's too long. You just cannot do that. Physically impossible. So human beings who are in this situation, they are screaming beating each other up with these long instruments, trying to feed themselves and put the food into their own mouths, and it will never work because of the general situation around the table. Again, long utensils tied to your arm, both arms, you cannot change that. And then someone finds it out that if you start to feed the other person right opposite at the other end of the table, because they can just use the, your utensils, the food that you put on, your own fork and your own spoon, then people start to feed each other and that brings about general sustenance and happiness. And that's the difference between heaven and hell. 
not much, not much else. So in how people think about themselves and themselves only, and there can be a very, very nice infrastructure around it, still it's very selfish. But when people think about each other, and they form natural communities, and these communities start to have real heart-to-heart, human-to-human relationships, we call that original family. A Sangha like this is an original family. Why? Everybody comes here out of their free will, Everybody is conforming to the same standards, and everybody per performs the same function in their own way. Okay, so nobody is put into a uniform. Nobody is here against their will, and nobody is following something that they don't want. Okay, we call that natural-born community. And no matter how much happy we want to be by ourselves, together we can do that a lot better. Okay. So we have a lot of people today, which is wonderful. And this is my main message for the introductory. And now I would like to welcome questions. Why? I also have to tell you why. What I say is less important than what you want to know. If you have questions, then this Dharma talk has value. If you have no questions, this, this Dharma talk has no value. Okay? Right. Because what is it that really goes into your head? What really goes into your head is not my speech. What really goes into your head is what you want to know. And what you want to know comes in forms of questions. So don't let this Buddhist talk just go over your head. Look inside and ask what you really want to know. And now comes the more valuable part of the Dharma talk because of you, all of you. So, does anybody have any questions? Any kind? <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
crisis? Crisis, yes. Wasn't it? Yes, it's correct. <laughs> what the mean? Meaning of that? I, I, I will explain. <laughs> yeah, there are many ways to come to the Buddha's path, okay? One is you are interested. You read a couple of books, your friends recommend it, and you come here just, we call it peacetime. Your, your mind is okay, you live your everyday life. And you may have some questions, but they're not critical questions, and your system, your I, my, me is working, okay? I didn't come through that. I had very, very deep and serious questions. I really, truly did not know who I was, why. When you learn about role-playing, uh, you understand that now, as we are, we are in the Buddhist role. Sunim in the Buddhist monk, me, myself in the Buddhist monk role, the Bosanim's role, the Gosanim's. Everybody's playing that social and spiritual role. But what is it that plays it? Or does it? Now, when I was 24, this kind of question was deeper than usual because I had to make choices. I had to take some, some directions, what I want to do with my life. And I really did not know what is it that makes the choices and what is the correct choice. So I had to stop. I had to stop and I had to kind of retreat from the usual everyday life. First, just going to the Buddhist community that we had already in 1990 in Budapest. And uh, I had to look inside instead of looking outside. I had to make inner choices instead of external or outer choices. And that was very useful. It changed my life completely. Because if you are quote-unquote fine, then you don't take the trip outside the palace which the Buddha did. Okay? So your palace is your I. Your palace is your ego. Okay? And once you have to take the trip because the, do the doors are forcibly opened, your critical questions, your unresolved you know, issues, open the doors and then you see birth, old age, sickness and death. And the question is, then what? What is it that you really want to do? You know, the Buddha asked his uh, car driver, he says, Chunda, do kings also die? Do kings also get sick? And he says, yes, sir. Your Majesty, that is true about kings. And he says, I don't want my outside kingdom, okay? I want to become free from life and death. Now, of course, everybody has a different approach and a different experience. But somehow, the veil of illusion has to shatter. And it's good to be in, in critical kind of mental and emotional states from time to time, because it forces you to change. So crisis is not bad if you can make the next step, okay? And uh, these very deep questions to which I did not accept any individual answers, any religious answers, anything that was in the books, I wanted something which I can experience. And the first thing that really happened is that uh, in this meditation group called Quantum School of Zen in Hungary, there were really wise people and uh, one of them said that if you can ask a question, you can also answer it yourself. Because where the questions come from, that's where the answers come from. We may not believe it at first. Because we are used to education and school and all that, that you have a question and you go to the internet or to books and teachers, etc. And they give you the answer. But if you really want to wake up, then the answer is inside. The answer is in your mind, which means we get back to the Buddha's original teaching that we all have Buddha nature. All human beings have Buddha nature, without exception. That means we have all the potential for enlightenment. The question is, do we dig down deep enough and attain it and bring it up or not? And that's when your life can change. That's when you can change your life. No one does it for you. In Buddhism, on the path, no one wants you to believe anything, okay? Keep your eyes clear, keep your ears clear, keep your mind open, and experience this moment as it is. 
And this moment is the door. This moment is the key to this whole thing, to this whole issue. If you attain this moment and you're not following your thinking, you're not following outside conditions and opinions, then you can look inside and ask, what am I? Or what is this that's listening right now? What is this that's talking right now? And when you ask that question really deeply, sincerely, in Korean it's called Hwadu. Literally, the head of the word. The first of all thoughts, or before any other thought appears. Then you can attain the answer to this. And that's something you can experience. No one can give it to you, and no one can take it away from you. That's how powerful practice is. Okay? So I was not interested in uh, orthodox or dogmatic religions. Uh, I, I never was part of it. And uh, just due to my education, my upbringing, etc., I could develop a very broad and very critical intellect. So that was, that was the way. And it's open to basically anybody who is not ready to just buy canned food, but want to make your own, cook your own. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Is, is there a, such a thing in the Dharma as the Ten Commandments? No. We don't have such thing in the Dharma. Instead of that, we have precepts. And uh, one really important point is that the precepts are taken upon voluntarily. So, you are not commanded not to kill, but I vow not to take any life. You are not commanded not to steal, but you vow not to take things not given, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Kasamuni 그런 거에 그 순간이 사람이 보면 그게 보통 깨친다라는 거 그래서 그거는 자기한테 달려있다 그렇게 말씀하셨고 그리고 또 아까 저쪽 분이 말씀, 질문하신 거는 그러니까 기독교에서는 어, 그 십계명 그런 거에 대해서 있잖아요 근데 어, 불교에서도 그런 게 있냐고 물어보셨는데 스님이 불교는 그런 게 아니라 보살계라고 있어서 그러니까 예를 들어서 교회에서는 어, 뭐 해라 이렇게 얘기하지만 불교에서는 내가 그거를 보살이나 이런 걸 받고 싶으면 하는 거고 그러니까 본인한테 달려있는 거 누가 시켜서 하는 게 아니라 내가 그거를 받고 싶으면 받고 아니면 안 하고 내가 그거에 대해서 따르고 싶으면 따르지 누가 이렇게 해라 그런 입장이 아니라는 거 그렇게 말씀하셨습니다. Let's get back to the question, sir. Please repeat it. Oh. <coughs> I just, I, want, I wondered if there was a uh, an analogous to the Ten Commandments, and you answer that with the, where they don't call it a commandment but a precept. So exactly, yeah. and they operate very, very differently because you recognize the necessity of reducing suffering on earth. <coughs> when you start practicing, then inside you see cause and effect relationship. What your mind does, <coughs> what your mind does, your speech does also. What your mind and speech do, your actions reflect that. So that's why when we meditate, we don't just try to feel, quote unquote, happy and distract ourselves from everyday life. We process everyday life, we digest our karma, and we see the cause and effect relationship of the universe. That includes ourselves. How we operate, how we work as human beings. It's not scientific, it's not philosophical, it's not psychological, it's direct perception of reality, okay? And direct perception of cause and effect. It's very different from any scientific, psychological or philosophical discipline or let alone religion, okay? It's the furthest from religion that's, that's ever possible, okay? 
In religion you are told what to do, you are told what to believe. In this spiritual quest to attain our true self and the substance of this universe, you discover, you attain. And when you have discovered cause and effect very clearly, you realize what it does to kill people, what it does or what it really means to take things not given. Everything comes back to you. Everything's reflected back from the great mirror, you know. So when people have this recognition, then they do take the precepts because they want their minds to be totally straight. Your own mind. It's like your own vehicle. You want very good guidance system, your GPS, okay? Plus very good steering wheel, traction control, etc. Without that, you can't go where you want to go. So it's the same with the precepts. If you want to attain your true self and reduce or take away suffering from this world, precepts are the natural reflection of this. <coughs> and that's why people who recognize this take precepts. They may recognize it just very, very, very little at the beginning of their spiritual practice. But when they do, they take the precepts because it's a very clear public statement of their direction. Okay? It helps other people too. Okay? It works very differently from commandment. Why? Uh, commandments are valid as long as there is enough hope and fear to keep them. Precepts do not operate in that way. In Zen, especially when you read the rules of uh, temple life and retreats created by Zen Master Pai Chang, he says in the first chapter of our temple rules, you already understand the five or the ten precepts. Know when to keep them, know when to break them, when they are open and when they are closed. Sounds strange, right? It's on your face. It sounds strange because it has a very different approach. It puts you into responsible position. It opens the question to you. Keep it or break it? Open or closed? So if you keep the precepts for yourself to become a perfect individual, you already broke them. <laughs> you made an I. And this strong I has a strong big problem, okay? So if you read Zen stories, what happens to great Zen masters who attain the Dharma and they were perfect and they have to attain karma, they have to attain imperfection also. Okay? That's, that's the wisdom behind it. It's not a license for anything. Never. But it's really important to see that for all beings, that's the direction. Practice and help all beings. Okay? And that defines, moment to moment, whether a given precept is open or closed. i give you an example. There's a precept not to lie, okay? I, I, I vow not to tell lies, okay? But, you are in the forest. And in this forest, there's a path forking left and right. And there's a little rabbit, a cute, wonderful white rabbit, running off to the right. And there's a hunter, a big redneck, you know, coming with a gun. <laughs> And he's asking you, who's standing at the very cross of these forks, where did the rabbit go? Come on, I'm going to shoot some rabbit for lunch today. <laughs> I mean, that guy doesn't need a rabbit for survival. <clears throat> That's killing for sport. I mean, most hunting these days is like that, unless you're in Africa. So, what do you do? If you're attached to the precept, you say, because you don't want to lie, you want to be perfect. <laughs> oh, sir, it went to the right, this way. So, five minutes later, you hear a big, big <laughs> shot fired, rabbit killed. You kept the precept which took a life. Okay? So, if you are really kind of neutral and you don't want to break the precept or keep the precept, you stay silent. You pretend you didn't hear the guy. <laughs> you can do that. I mean, the guy is in a hurry. So if you pretend to be distracted, he just poof, goes away. Still, there's a 50% chance that he will go right. So there's a 50% chance he will kill the rabbit. So if you're a real Zen student, real Zen practitioner, you say, left, hurry! He went to the left. Then after half an hour, the guy comes running, running, sweating, and he says, ah, I missed it, I missed it. 
I says, good job, next time you find it, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's the real meaning of becoming spiritually adult, okay? These teachings and these, uh, whatever we call it, precepts, commandments, doesn't matter, these guidelines, I have to say, they are not to keep you sheep or keep you a child, okay? We grow up physically. Do we grow up mentally? That's the question. Sometimes people's bodies are very old, but their minds are like children's mind. They still need some notion of adult above themselves to feel secure and complete. And when you start to practice the path, you realize you have Buddha nature, you can get enlightenment. This world is already complete, there's nothing missing. Okay? And there's no other way of solving this problem than all of us attaining awakening and all of us trying to help this world. There is no other way. And that's wide enough. That's actually broad enough that we can all follow that in our own fashion, in our own style. Awakening doesn't mean only Korean Buddhism. I have, I have to know that. You know, I have to note that. Okay? So, this might be surprising for you or for most of you. But how to grow up spiritually, how to become an adult spiritually, you have to take responsibility into your own hands. There is no dogmas, there is no orthodoxy, there is no fixed set of rules, there is only moment to moment, how do you keep your correct situation, correct relationship, correct function. So Zen, real practicing Zen, it asks questions rather than tells you definitions. Okay? More questions? Yeah. Um, you said earlier that um, once you've attained, or once you're on the path of enlightenment, you get a direct perception of reality. Absolutely. And what I've heard from Buddhism <clears throat> is that there is no perception. There is only the reality. You know, things are... 50%. If there's no perception, how can there be reality? <laughs> well, that, that there is only perception. Maybe I should correct myself. That there's only what you perceive as the world to be. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think I've heard that on talks on emptiness uh -huh. and how to to really see what's out there in the world, mm -hmm. which is you know what you perceive the world to be. What color is this wall? <laughs> well, I guess the color I perceive it to be grayish white. So if we edit out all the Buddhist charade, it's one simple sentence: What color is the wall? White. Correct. Forget the rest. Mm. <laughs> that's Zen. If you, if you overdose yourself with Buddhist philosophy, that's a kind of addiction. Mm. Don't do that. Zen means empty all that out and really see that the sky is blue, the trees are green, the dogs are barking, and the helicopters are zoom, 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 zoom around. Very simple. Very simple mind. You want Buddhist philosophy, there is so many of them that in two and a half lifetimes you won't finish. <laughs> Go ahead. I love to talk about the direct experiments myself. I don't, I don't really interest of dogma or anything, but I read a lot about theory like her. Uh -huh. uh, my question is still, I cannot explain to you about how I express, uh, experience about enlightenment, but it's, uh, my interest is more going towards the Buddha's teaching, which we all try to become mm -hmm. the Buddha, a Buddha, whatever. But um, I can ex <coughs> give you experience because I don't know what is the enlightenment or what awakened. That's but very lucky. It's really correct that way. How could you possibly explain something which is beyond words and speech? Right. You can use it, but you cannot explain it. Right. If you can explain it, it's already dead. So, in Chinese wisdom, there was a saying, if something, your lower arm, is good in one piece, why chop it up into small pieces? So it's the same thing. What we are doing, actually, is a very kind of imperfect or even incorrect way of transmitting the Dharma. I'm using words. I'm using words and speech. Okay? It's very, very primitive. But we have this really primitive dualistic intellect which needs food, which is hungry. 
and therefore we have very high class food, the Buddha's teaching in a verbal form. But enlightenment or attainment can never be substituted with words. Okay? So the Buddha didn't read sutras. The Buddha tried to practice. And when he practiced, he attained something. I mean, do you see the morning star or the Venus as it comes up every morning? You can. I mean, if you're awake at that time, you can. Do you get enlightenment? Mostly we don't. We see the star. So do we know what the Buddha attained at that time? After six years of practice, almost <coughs> dying up in the mountains, going into extremes and then coming down and you know, practicing on the, on the rivers. Do we know what we attained? We don't. We call it enlightenment because its mind light is still shining at us to the present day. You know, if you look at the lineage of teachers who just spread out to the ten directions after his teaching became public, he didn't want to make it public. Okay? He says it's too simple. It's too difficult for this thinking mind to understand. Okay? But eventually he decided to do so. So, there is no possibly any words that can describe it, but the function is very clear. So, if your enlightenment functions correctly, then uh, people with keen eyes can see it. And you don't have to prove yourself. There's no need. Just moment to moment, situation, relationship, function. If it's all clear, then your mind, speech, action help all beings. So no doubt. If I understood, if we become awakened, for example, mm -hmm. we are not becoming like Buddhas like that. Of course not. It would be a waste. I mean, putting yourself over gold and gilded and <laughs> no, that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my next question: Why we are keeping that? For you, it's a reminder. It's a reminder that you can do the same thing as he did. Okay. It's reminding you of your ultimate and utmost potential. You know, kids have these rock star posters and car race posters and all kinds of girls have different posters in their rooms. Why? This is their ideal. It's their, it's their vision. It reminds them every single time they enter the room, hey, I can be a rock star. Same thing. It's not different. It reminds you, you can become Buddha. And the bodhisattvas are the various functions of the Buddha mind. Don't think of them as separate entities, okay? We personify them because, because human beings think that this is us, so we have to personify aspects or functions of our mind. So, compassion. Okay, let's give a name and a form to it. Avalokiteshvara, this beautiful bodhisattva, used to be male, but became female. It changes. This whole thing, in terms of name and form, changes. And the job of all these names and forms, these symbols and statues, etc., is to remind you that you can attain something which doesn't change, which doesn't come and go, which is above life and death. You know? Living and dying is not a problem, but look at the way we are born and we die. That's really not so nice. Okay? So we can really improve some human quality there. Okay? Yeah? Um, I feel like uh, what what other people think makes them happy doesn't really make them happy. So I'm just wondering, how do you know what makes someone happy? I don't know. <laughs> it's not my job. You, you imagine how long my list would be? 6.6 6 billion people's individual happiness conditions. I mean, that's a long one. I mean, it's more than Santa Claus. I mean, Santa Claus works about two, three days a year. Monks never stop working. <laughs> so, what, what should be clear here, that everybody has to wake up to the notion of true happiness. Okay? And once you put down your I, my, me, and you look at the world, what is it that's really necessary in the world? Then you keep your mind very clear. You keep your heart very open. You, you do correct together action with other people, wherever you are. Okay? And when you do that, that brings about genuine happiness. With or without ice cream, doesn't matter. Okay? So ice cream happiness, very limited. Okay? Depends on ice cream. <laughs> but 
true human happiness, mind-to-mind, heart-to-heart connection, that depends on just us, mm -hmm. just human beings. I mean, uh, we are here in the melting pot of all nations. I mean, that's what the United States used to be called, the melting pot of all nations. Mm -hmm. What is it that really brings about genuine human communities in a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-religious society? Have you ever asked that question from, you know, to yourself? Because there are really happy moments when people feel a genuine sense of belonging to each other. How does that happen? Well, it starts with putting down your own opinion, your own condition, your own dualistic thinking, and really start to pay attention to the other person. Start to pay attention to the group instead of just yourself. Instead of just being competitive, try to be cooperative. It's, it's really simple. But without an inner spiritual transformation, it will not work. Okay? So, ask questions inside. Practice in a way that your own thinking will kind of go down a little bit. It will recede. It will not be so important. Then you start to see and perceive other people. The real situation. Not what you think it is, but what it really is. Okay? There is no recipe. If, it were, if there was a general, genuine recipe coded, it would be very expensive. <laughs> yeah? It's not a question, it's a comment. I, um, I believe you like to hear more experience than talking, teaching. And uh, I discovered a lot of experience through, well, since I become Buddhi Buddhist, say Buddhist, I used to be a Christian and <coughs> uh, grew up in a Christian family, which I love uh, Jesus Christ. The Sir, I'm sorry, something. can you stop there? Thank you. Okay. Um, and I'm an artist, yeah. so I grew up as an ego-centric person. But still, I'm struggling as e with my ego. and. Um, what I understood with the Buddha's teaching, I have to get it off my ego to become a better person. Not better person to be for somebody else, but just for me. Um, and since the practice little by little I do, I see myself changing myself. And um, that projected when I go outside, for example, seeing people. Uh, for example, when I saw ugly people, I don't want to even deal with that. Because mm -hmm. how, how I can talk with other people, for example, I did it. I, I had this kind of behavior. But when I changed myself, well, I kind of think about what is your ego, which is so wonderful about it, so that you consider that person you just saw, that person was so ugly, that you cannot talk and you cannot be next to. So in the very funny way, that ugly person was me, not the person that was in front. So that was a kind of interesting experience I had. What do you think about that? There's not much to think about it, you know. You, you experienced your own projection, how your projection became reality. So you thought ugly became ugly. If you follow aesthetic conventions, then it's very quick. Okay? You think beautiful becomes beautiful. <coughs> and so what is really truly important that you see how your mind operates. And the reason why you have to attain the moment is that your mind operates very quickly. It's quicker than any computer. So if you really want to perceive how your mind works and how you make ugly, how you make beauty, how you make I, okay? then you have to keep a mind which is not moving. And if you attain that clear mirror mind, this unmoving consciousness, then in that you can perceive everything, truly like in a mirror. You go to the bathroom, you look at yourself in the mirror, you see yourself that morning. Whether you like it or not, that's you. Okay? Then, then you ask yourself, hmm, do I look nice today? Does my projection work? Okay? <laughs> so, then usually uh, some other thinking also appears.
But once you see how this thinking operates, once you perceive, you will operate differently because of this perception. So this perception makes all the difference without making another I, another kind of thinking. So your first part, the, the first part of your question was like, uh, you try to change yourself. How can you do that? You try to kind of conquer your ego. I'm tired of it. Ego, trying to conquer ego. That's like trying to put out fire with gasoline. <laughs> It creates more conflicts. And in fact, if, if people want to do that, I should say they should go all the way. So fight yourself 100%. Why? To see how futile it is. Don't fight yourself. Instead of fighting, have some discipline. That's different. Instead of trying to kill some part of your ego, which is not different from the one which tries to kill it, okay? Return to this not moving mind, which is not born and it never dies. Because that has no I at all. But you cannot get there by fighting. As long as you maintain a <coughs> dualistic relationship to yourself or to any being on earth, you will never wake up. You will never become one. So when you become one, this fighting stops. <coughs> you realize there's no one to fight and there's nothing to fight about. Okay? So, uh, mistakenly, sometimes people say, okay, then I just have to relax. No. Relax is not enough. One more step is necessary. So let's say we try to pursue the happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And we have the mind to go to the happiness, right? Then if it's too much, then we can attach to the I need to be happy, the attachment, right? So how can we be happy without the attachment, right? So, like I said at the very beginning, your happiness is not your individual happiness, okay? 아까 선생님이 말씀하신 것처럼 어, 우리가 말하는 행복이라는 것은 개인적인 행복이 아니라는 거. If you focus on your individual happiness, you are already attached. 만약에 그게 내가 행복하고 싶다는 그 마음을 갖고 있으면 그건 벌써 자기의 그 집착이 들어 있다는 Oh, no. If, no, no, no. Let, me, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. Okay. Then, if you have other people around you, your family, your friends, etc., and you try to be happy together, then it's impossible to become attached to your individual happiness. Don't worry about practice, okay? <laughs> uh, no, I mean the... Um, Do it. I practice, cannot. and practice will teach mm. you what is correct. Mm. Okay? Your own experience will teach you what is correct. Just do it, do it, do it. And if you do it for many years consistently, it's impossible to be in any of the extremes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With all due respect, your, your question <laughs> comes from a thinking problem. Mm -hmm. It's not a practicing problem. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
내가 나를 놓은 상태가 되면 이제 뭐든지 이렇게 좀더 이렇게 앞으로 나갈 수 있다는 거. 아까 그거 잠깐 얘기하셨고, 그거는 뭐 어떤 책이나 뭐 누가 말해서 그런 게 아니라 본인 스스로가 자기가 그거를 찾아야 되는 거고, 그리고 사람들이, 아, 너, 어, 깨쳤니? 뭐, 이렇게, 뭐, 당신은 뭐, 인라이트스니까 이렇게 물어보거나, 그렇게 되면은, 그거는, 그렇게 됐다는 거를 말로 이렇게 설명할 수 없다는 거야. 그거는 내가 표현하고 말이나 이런 거로 됐을 때, 그거를 얘기를 하면, 그거는 된게 아니라는 거야. 그거는 우리가 생각할 수 있는 그 이상에 있는 것이고, 만약에 그러면 저 사람이, 예를 들어서, 어, 그 사람이 어떻게, 뭐, 깨쳤으니까 그걸 어떻게 아냐. 그런 거에 대해서는 만약에 내가 수행을 해서 내가 그런 눈을 갖고 있으면 내가 그런 사람을 보면 그 사람을 이렇게 볼수 있다는 거예요. 그러니까 그거는 말로 하는 게 아니라 자기가 그렇게 수행을 해서 그런 눈을 가지면 상대방 가서 아, 저 사람도 얼마큼 됐구나. 그런 거를 스스로 알게 되지. 그거를 이렇게 말이나 글로 되는 게 아니고 아까 또 질문하신 것 중에 아, 이쪽 분이 질문하신 것 중에 아까 10개명과 어, 5개, 10개 그런 거에 대해서 얘기하셨을 때는 음, 그, 보통 불교에서는 인간 음모를 알게 되면. Later. Now just translate my speech. Not earlier. Okay. So, to round up the question, if you practice consistently and your practice becomes clear, you attain what we call the joy of the Dharma. Just this question. 계속 수행을 하시면은 그 범, 법에 대한, 그 불법에 대한 것을 알게 될 거예요. And since we practice together, we share the joy of the Dharma. 그리고 같이 서로가 수행을 하면은 그 기쁨을 같이 누릴 수 있는 거고. And that takes care of any kind of attachment that people may develop. 그 그렇게 되면 사람들이 이렇게 그 하면서 어떻게 되는 집착을 다 없앨 수 있습니다. If people do solo retreats too long and maybe too early, then they are prone to what we call Dharma accidents. <laughs> <laughs> that they can have like <laughs> accidents on the road, accident on the path. <laughs> so when people have or do too much solo retreat and it's alone. <laughs> Why? Because if you practice in the wrong way, the community fixes you right away. You can mm. you can oh. go to Korean temples, Korean Zen rooms. The community is so strong that your individual ego cannot even appear. It's already hit. Mm. If you go to an amja, a hermitage, and you practice alone for a long time, if you are not correctly prepared and you mm. still have a lot of heavy karma, your opinions become stronger. <coughs> and that is dangerous. That's the only danger you can have. But even from hermitages, the monks or nuns can come down and will come down eventually, then they see what they've done. And uh, with group retreats, there's Kyoche, there's Heje. Kyoche, Heje. Kyoche is retreat time, three months. Heje, three months outside. Mixing. That's very important. It's like forging a sword. That's important one? Because it is like forging a sword. 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 Sword, understand? Okay. Making sword. Okay. When you have sword under the under making, you put it into fire, becomes hot, red hot. You take it out, hammer, bam, 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 long time. Then you put it into water, then back to fire, then hammer again, then into oil, then back to fire. Same thing with practicing. Has to happen like that. 수행하는 게 보통 칼을 만드는 것처럼 그 불에 넣었다가 빼서 다시 그 망치질하고 또 물에다 놓고 이렇게 당, 당근지? 그렇게 하는 것처럼 하는 거라고. So that means you experience many things 
but your past remains straight. You experience many things, but your path remains straight. Okay. What's that? Chill with this issue. Ah, 저희 한국의 그큰 스님들, 뭐 법정 스님이나 그런 큰 스님들은 수행과 좀다 끝나지고 혼자 앉아서 오랜 시간을 보내시잖아요. 그리고 좋은 책을 내시고 우리는 깨달음을 많이 주시잖아요. 그런 건 어떻게? Uh, some Korean monastics, the famous, like Hapjong Sunim or other monks, you know, they will practice for a long time, and then by themselves, then they like Amja, right? And then they are writing the books, then you know, people use that as a No, I said something more than that. Which means that if you are unprepared, or you still have a lot of heavy karma, and then you begin long individual solo practice, then you have a problem. The reason being is that we all are born with different karma. The sixth patriarch, Yukcho Desa, he was born with such a pure karma, he heard one sentence from the Diamond Sutra, he attained enlightenment. That was it. He didn't practice. But it is also true, and very few people know it, that our tradition says, Korean Zen says, he had been practicing for 80 lifetimes. Okay? And then it is possible to wake up by one sentence. Okay? <laughs> so if you really want to understand this, you should look at the 10 ox herding pictures. 10 ox herding pictures. See, actually, it's not a linear succession of ten pictures one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten begins with one, ends at ten. It's a circle, it's a loop. Okay? Why? Because it represents practicing life. So, the ox is brown at the beginning. It's white at the end. That means you are full of karma, you're totally covered with this brown thing. Okay? And as your practice, progress is you, your true self becomes more and more clear. It's very rare that we would be born as a totally white ox. The, the sixth patriarch was like that, okay? So for those sunims and also to for those lay people who have very little brown left mm -hmm. on the white ox, solo retreat, no problem. <laughs> in fact, as uh, practitioners become older and older and more mature in their practice, it is necessary to go out there, stay alone. They have not much else to do. I mean, yeah. you know, they have done their share. <coughs> you go to you go to some chosen hermitage above Hainsa, yeah, it's one of yeah. the most beautiful places on earth. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> he was there and he had a couple of monks staying around, a couple of Bosalim staying around. Yeah. You know? That was his natural karma, okay? Mm. I also met a, a, a very senior Sunim who was the abbot of Namhedo Boryan for 25 years. Okay? And he lived 
in a small Amja, you know, mm -hmm. about six, seven kilometers, you know, in the same place, Namhedo. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was amazing. He was a fantastic being because for, I mean, he was the living embodiment of Kwan Sambosa. His yeah. energy was yeah. fantastic. He's still alive? I, I, I don't know. I saw him f three, four years ago last time. But uh, next time I want to go and see. But how do you know we are born as brown or white? You don't know. <laughs> I know we don't know, but how we recognize that? So you have to so just Your friends will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> for, for example, my husband said I am enlightened, that means I am enlightened? No, that, that means you have to give him coffee. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, yeah, please. My name is Mita, and uh, I, I wonder uh, um, you talk about this, and uh, I miss uh, really Sunsan uh, Zen Master. Me too. I really miss him. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> what, what did you uh, cause to uh, become a monk with the Sunsan Master? I have to reveal my ignorance. Uh, I just can tell you how it happened, and I'm sure it will kind of give you a point of interest, but there is no ultimate reason here. You have to understand that. I mean, is there a reason why the sun is shining when there are no clouds? The only reason is there are no clouds, so the sun is shining. There's no other reason. Okay? So, I met him really in 1991, April, in Hungary. He came to Hungary for the second and last time. I had been practicing for less than half a year, actually a little more than half a year. I had my first Yong Meng Jong Jin weekend meditation, and I was a very kind of uh, uh, brown ox. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when he came, then he, he really put things very straight, right on the floor, okay? We had a public talk with 400 people in a big university auditorium. I asked him publicly a question. And he publicly answered, and next day there was a meditation workshop, I again asked him a question, and again he answered, that was it. So I, I knew that was my teacher. There was no question after that, okay? What when did you, you ask about? The first question was, can thinking be an action? Because mm -hmm. he always said, don't think, only do it, don't think, only do it. He said, then I, I wanted to catch him, okay? <laughs> and I said, sir, can thinking be an action? Then he explained to me the Zen circle. There are five kinds of thinking, he says. Attachment thinking, intellectual thinking, no thinking, magic thinking, clear thinking. Which one do you like? So, oh. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> this, this monk knows a lot more than I do. <laughs> and probably that was the desired effect. At that time I was really proud of my knowledge. Okay? Next, um, during the meditation workshop, I was very much interested in theater in those days, role playing. You know? And uh, and then I, I asked him, Sir, what do you think about theater and becoming someone else than, than you actually are? He says, Theater, not good, not bad, no problem. But <laughs> if you think your theater is number one, mm -hmm. that's number one bad. <laughs> <laughs> so so it was like that. And, uh, and uh, I cannot say I just. See, our thinking is so limited, and our emotions are, of course, a little bit more of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But when there is this some, there, there's somebody with this full Dharma energy, it really connects to you, just boom. Mm -hmm. So, at that time, I had no defenses. I had real questions, wow. okay? And he was the one who answered with wisdom, compassion, and true power. Mm -hmm. So, for me, there was no kind of left or right after that. It's like small duck sees the big duck. Like, wow! <laughs> okay, let's go. And then a year later, uh, I was finishing university and at that time at five years, an MA at the end, and um, I was teaching at the high school. It was part of the university curriculum. And then uh, the lesson was finished. I was waiting for somebody there's white gravel in a very big courtyard and green trees around it and wind and a cloudless beautiful sky. And uh, I'm waiting in the silence, just listening to the wind. And uh, out of nothing this thought appeared, how wonderful it would be to become monk this lifetime. So where did that thing come from? <laughs> I didn't know. But it was so clear, so unprecedented and so much without echo 
that it just stayed in my mind and I said, okay, get a job first. So become <laughs> independent and get a job first. Don't just uh, kind of rush. And in two years I was monk. Hmm. So, other question? Good. Sir. Sir, may I ask you how much this question helps you get enlightenment? <laughs> <laughs> So, how much does this question help him get enlightenment? If we learn about the, all the Buddha's relics, how much does that help us? Gosan, true relic has no form. <laughs> True relic has no name. One person at a time, please. So, because so many Korean temple advertise they have a Buddha the relic, relic so. so he just wondering how many. <laughs> I am really not an expert in marketing, <laughs> <laughs> so relic not my business. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot answer the question how many real relics there are, but if I want to count in this room, we have at least fifty <laughs> relics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You practice, you follow the path, you are the Buddha's relic, okay? <laughs> That's it. Little sari, very expensive, you know. Okay. I I have to disappoint you. <laughs> I am not a historian of Buddhism. I am not a relic expert in Buddhism. I am a simple monk and quite ignorant, okay? So, I cannot answer these really, really, maybe other very, very deeply educated Korean uh, Sunims can answer it. Okay, please. So, anybody has a little more stupid question like Zen question? <laughs> <laughs> Stupid question. Go ahead. So, yeah. I have several friends, and actually, uh, a, a, pr an, a priest that that claim they've converted to Buddhism, but the the reason they did was that to become free of Western moral traditions and laws, like age of consent laws. Uh, homosexual uh, kind of acts that, that they could be free to do, um, these kinds of things that, and because they think Buddhism is just free, more free than, than the Christian tradition. Uh, do you, I mean, are you sure they did that for this reason? Yeah. And any results? <laughs> well, the result wasn't, it wasn't good in most cases. Yeah, because they made their own choice. 
because most of these laws, although we have a bunch of books about precepts and rules and everything, the real laws are unwritten. And as you discover how re real Buddhist tradition operates, you, can, you may find it even tighter than the West. Okay? And those, those people who look for this unlimited liberty or, or all these things that you actually mentioned, they have to be severely disappointed. Because the Orient didn't, didn't kind of approach it from this really rigid, systematic, external point of view. They always pointed at the individual. Okay? What are you? What are your desires? What is it that makes you angry? Okay? What is it that you can call your true self? What is your path? Okay? So we ask these questions instead of being moralistic or overly ethical about uh, issues. But you experience all these things inside and that burns you. I mean, you can get away with some good lawyer. Okay? But inside, you don't start to kind of mitigate yourself. You don't start to make all these false reasons why you are allowed to do this, whereas in the West you are. After these circles, after these kind of self-preservation attempts are gone, they are in hell, in their own hell. And they really experience, it's not some biblical talk, we make hell within ourselves. So if we have bad, quote-unquote, bad karma of abuse, of possession, of being utterly selfish and using other human beings just for our happiness, okay? Watch out, it comes back to you because the, the East, you know, teaches you, see it for yourself. It's not just, well, I think it's open, I think it's possible. Yes, you think, but look at cause and effect. This, this is not a one-way trip, okay? So you do something, you see it. I'm sure that your friends or those people who actually had this kind of intent, they woke up. Well, Definitely they woke up because otherwise... Two of them are alcoholics, so... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Compensation till you die, okay? And the problem is that they are born with that kind of disposition next lifetime, okay? It's not a problem of, yeah, I'm drinking for 30 years, then it's over. Yeah. You are reborn with that kind of really, really suscept kind of strong susceptibility that you're offered a drink and you're hooked. Okay? Yeah? Thank you. You're welcome. Did you put your hands up? So you were just kind of scratching the <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry, let me just look around for new questions. Yes? Um, if I can, I want to learn how to control myself, especially my emotion. Wow. Why do you want to control your emotions? <laughs> <laughs> For example, um, somebody who has great loss, loss like, okay, um, my mom passed away two years ago. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> oh, like this. Mm. Oh, there it is. Bosani, it's very good that you talk about the specific issue. Mm -hmm. So collect yourself, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And now, the specific issue is your mother passed away two years ago. Go okay. ahead. Okay. <laughs> and. Oh. <laughs> oh, whenever I just think about her, it's like this. I can't be happy at all. And not only me, all my, my family, you know. So I want to just control myself. I want to focus myself how to. You know, emotion. Bosonim, I am, I am very sorry, mm -hmm. but you are still thinking about yourself. How about thinking about your mother? Okay? Mm -hmm. So, at first you are bereft, you suffer some loss. Then you want to control yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you want to forget it and become happy. Mm -hmm. That's all about you. So, how about helping your mother? Mansung Sinim is a wonderful monk and he will teach you Jijang Bosa chanting, okay? <laughs> and you chant Jijang Bosa for your mother. You yeah. can do that, yeah. okay? If your mother passed away more than three years, then Kwansa and Bosa are necessary because she's probably in a new body, okay? But as long as she might be in the state of death, don't worry, death is not this horrible thing, okay? Just having a mind without a body, okay? That's simple. So when you're in that state or when anybody is in that state, they need help. 
because most of them they don't recognize first of all they are dead next when they do recognize it they don't know what to do so all these things appear they don't have a body they don't have senses but they have perception and that's a problem so you change Yijang Bosa, that energy helps them. They connect with living beings po positively. Your mind energy and the Sangha's mind energy, whoever's chanting, helps them find their way. It works like that in any tradition, okay? So how about forgetting yourself a little bit and chant for your mother, if, unless you have done that, but if you still have some karma left, you have to transform that attachment and that self-concern and self-pity into helping another being and Kido is the best way to do that okay so if you do that it helps your mother and it helps you move on because she died you are alive you have to move on with your life okay can you do that for your mo mother promise me you will do that okay good thank you uh, yeah, I, I... Uh, I talk to uh, I talk with Korean. Then the chair. Uh, I'm sorry. We just translate a little bit, and then your question comes. Yeah, yeah. Right. He wants to ask me. Please. Yeah. Oh. I know Chondoje. Yeah, Chondoje. But the Gyeongjeon, I know that the Gyeongjeon, the Gyeongjeon, the Gyeongjeon, the Gyeongjeon, the Gyeongjeon, the Gyeongjeon, the 부처님이 돌을 연못에서 집어 던지면서 누가 기도로 저 돌을 떠오르게 할수 있느냐 하니까 아무도 그럴 수 없다고 그랬거든요. 누가 그러니까 어떤 사람이 부처님한테 물어봐. 부처님 제자가. 음. 네. 그러니까 아니 없어. 근데. 그러니까 저도 이렇게 하시는 거못 해봤어. One of the disciples asked him, "Let's say we can if we was the person passed away, then we can do chandra to him. Can we have a new life?" Yeah. Then the uh, answer to him. So he, uh, Buddha, Buddha said, no, no, nobody can, you know, yeah, the, ra the raise the stone up from the, you know, first of. And the Buddha answered like, okay, in the lake he draw the, the stone into the water, mm -hmm. and who can pick up the, the stone from the water? We have to make this issue clear, okay? Because you cannot resurrect the dead. You cannot resurrect the dead. You cannot make them come back. Yeah. Number number two, you cannot essentially change their karma. You can help them, but you cannot change their karma. So that's why the Buddha says that no one can make merited karma disappear. 그, 그 그, yeah, but when you don't have a body, your mind is very much lost, okay? Mm -hmm. And this kind of chanting points them away, okay? They, it can help them wake up in their cloud of illusion. So you just offered it, like we offer Jijang Bosa Kido or Kwan San Bosa Kido. Okay, but it doesn't mean that you give or take away any karma to that person. They have to do it themselves. Okay. Yeah, the six rounds. Yeah, okay. six rounds. Okay, then let's say someone was uh, in the like a hell, that that can that person can go to the like a heaven through the. Have you been to hell? <laughs> so what kind of sense would my answer make? If you experience hell, you know how to get there. I'm sorry. If you experience hell, you know how you got there. So you also know how you got back. Mm -hmm. OK? 
If you know how you got there, you also know how you get back. 지옥을 내가 갈수 있다면 그 저기 그 육도 중에 그 천천상 천상도 갈수 있는 거. Again, question. Your question comes from thinking. It's a theoretical question. So we say it. It's based on explanations and learning. 지금 질문하시는 것도 어떻게 보면 그 배우는 거 같아. It's not good, not bad, but it doesn't really help you, and it doesn't really help anyone. If you have some kind of experience, a real emotional or cognitive issue, which is truly yours, really yours, that helps. 그러니까 자기 자신의 자기가 스스로 경험을 진짜 해서 얻은 그것이 본인한테 도움이 되는 거지. 어, 아까 말씀하신 것처럼 뭐 책이나 주변에 이런 거에 대해서 그냥 아 이래서 이렇다라는 걸로 한다면 그거는 도움이 별로 안 되는 거다. We have very little time left. Two more questions and we're done. Yes, one. Um, I like helping people, so I help people, but then um, people end up um, using me and betray me. And then whenever I think of them, I get angry. And then I feel like I don't have to be nice to anyone. But then, um, like, and I also want to empty my angriness, but then I don't know how to. Okay, so satisfying people's desires and helping them are two different issues. Okay, so when we say, How may I help you? This is not a call center, how may I help you? Okay. So, it's really important to see what people need and what they want. There's a huge difference between the two most of the time. Yes. You have no obligation to satisfy their desires. You do not have to give them what they want, but you, you should always see what they really need. They will respect you for that if you help them satisfy their needs, not their desires, okay? And next thing, even though you may be able to do that, you should still kind of put yourself into your own service station, like a good car, and tune up. Okay? And for that, you have to practice. It's impossible that you could stay clear and unmoving and without any strong dualistic discrimination if you do not practice. Why? Sensory perceptions, including human speech, move your mind. It shouldn't happen. If your scale cannot come back to zero when there's nothing in the in the tray soon your mind can break okay the biggest problem with a life which is bound to the senses is not the fact that you are dependent on sensory perceptions what you see hear taste smell touch and think that we would be dependent on entertainment and food and sleep and all these things that's not the problem the problem is that all this makes our minds weak we can easily go into a shock it's easy to hypnotize, it's easy to modify, it's easy to do anything or manipulate that mind which is dependent on the senses. That's the problem. So, when there is zero, your mind should go back to zero. Okay? And that's original practice. And then you develop this consciousness which can reflect even the smallest thing, but is never shocked and never broken by even the biggest impact. Okay? In war, that's how soldiers stay alive or die. You become afraid, you become unfocused, you die. If you don't lose focus and you stop thinking and you move around, you act in a way that is really before thinking, then you survive and you get the job done. With big accidents, with big disasters, it's the same. And we have our kind of homemade disasters when there's a fight in the family, when people don't want to talk to each other, when there's strong emotions, strong opposites, etc. Et How do you handle that? Your mind moves, you're dead. You become angry, or you have some compensational desire, and then people become dependent on some substance, okay? Okay? All of that comes because we do not attain our true self. All of that comes because we do not have this unmoving body, unmoving speech, unmoving mind. And that's original practice, okay? So when you practice, you can handle all of that soon enough, okay? Then you clearly see.
help this person in the way he or she wants or help this person in the way he or she really needs it okay that's a very important point and as you grow it will help you become a good wife and a good mother <laughs> okay more questions yeah and and then yourself one and two Oh, is there any way that I can practice with my busy of daily life? Yes. So Especially. I don't really have time to go to the temple. In California, you have time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> is there any way that I can? Yeah, wake up a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to go. I mean, please come to the center as often as you can, but you cannot come here every day unless you are totally and absolutely a freelancer. Mm -hmm. But. Come here and do some together practice. It's very important. But every day, make it part of your daily routine. You get up, mm. do your kind of bathroom duties very quickly, and spend half an hour with some inside wash. Okay? Outside wash, we do it all the time. How much do we wash inside? Okay? So it's, it's really, really important to sit, actually bow, chant, and sit, but if you're family or neighbors do not tolerate chanting and they don't aggravate them, they're called the police. <laughs> <laughs> Officer, we have something strange going on next to me. <laughs> so, then you sit and at least the Korean Heart Sutra and the Great Dharani is necessary once a day. Okay? One gives you clarity, the other gives you compassion and power. Okay? So, in the Chon Suk Kyung, in the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra, there's the Great Dharani, also it's available separately. Mm -hmm. At least that and the Korean Heart Sutra is very important. Ten minutes, okay? And then you sit for 20 minutes, you do three bows and just before that, in 40 minutes you're done. And what a difference it makes when your karma does not overshadow your day. Okay? Try that. And then there are retreats when there's a longer tune-up time, etc., etc then you truly experience dharma happiness because mm. you can you can be truly yourself and you're not affected by other people's stupidity that's really important mm. right there um, I've been criticized by my friends um, because I'm a knowledge seeker and I like coming to these kinds of events and um, I have a friend who's saying um, if you're in search of a teacher then you don't really have what what it really takes within you because enlightenment is within you and you don't really need to go to any dharma talks or be in search of a teacher um to attain um so i'm wondering what your take your what your opinion is on searching for a teacher and whether or not it's necessary to have a teacher to enlightenment has no inside or outside that's number one okay the moment that these folks have this kind of opinion only inside they lose it. Mm. Only outside also lose it. Mm. Usually this kind of criticism comes when they want to put you into a cage mm. and they don't want you to do what you really want to do. Okay? Yes. Don't let that happen. So you can ask Bessie, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you go have coffee and movie, fine. I go to Dharma talk and after that I have coffee and movie. So what's, what's the matter? What are they afraid of? Why do they try to protect you? You're an adult. You're over 18. You do what you really want to do. So behind these questions is not their knowledge that they... Do they really know what is enlightenment? No. They know what they don't want you to do. Okay? That's what they want. And I'm not saying they're bad people. They're just ignorant. Mm -hmm. That's all. So you say, oh, thank you very much for your concern. I'm going to the temple now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyone has anything else? Last chance, then bye bye and only in Hungary <laughs> or in Korea. <laughs> yes? Oh, only if no one else did. Uh, they, they will take their time. That's okay. okay. You're not taking anyone else's time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, when I get um, from meditation, like buzzing all over my head, who um, <laughs> is that directly from? Uh, You're thinking. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> when it's buzzing in your head, it's it's the noise. Let me tell you how this works. No, I mean like a physical prickling. 
yeah, it feels physical, but it's actually like form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts translate into vibration, zzz, and vibration translate into thoughts and also feelings. So I'm sure you could, you see sometimes trains from a distance. Uh -huh. Trains from a distance look like just this silver worm. They just go along the horizon, right? You go closer and you can distinguish the carriages, the wagons. And you go even closer, you can see the windows. And you go even closer and you can see who is sitting. All those people who are sitting inside. But if you are at a distance, you just hear this and the train passes. But if you go close enough, then you see Jack and Jill and everybody else, you know, sitting <laughs> inside. You may even hear them talking. Mm -hmm. So when you go closer to your thinking, then you hear what you say inside. One voice, two voices, three, four, five, seven, doesn't matter. Okay? It's usually a very convoluted, chaotic movie. Then this movie becomes clear, then your thinking also becomes clear. It's still thinking, but it's more clear. Uh -huh. Okay? And then as you practice, you do some meditation, you focus on something else than your thinking, and it becomes a little more distant, mm -hmm. like the train. And then you only hear the noise of it. There is no direct cognition, there is no verbality, but maybe there is hearing that sound plus a little noise inside. And our meditation style, the Zen meditation, teaches you to really perceive sounds. Perceive sounds instead of your own noise. Because first, if you're attached to your own noise, then you and the world, you and the universe cannot become one. Okay? So when we say the Kan Hua Son, the perception path, is that you sit unmoving with eyes open and you put your energy down towards the ground, that means to your tanjon. And then soon, this noise in the head stops. Not a noise. So? Uh, no, I, I, sorry, I didn't finish my question. Go ahead. Um, it started happening about seven years into my meditation practice and um, I haven't had anyone to answer the question because it, and then I can't see anything. Everything, can't see anything? No, everything wow. just turns sort of foggy but gold and it's hard to drive and I have to bring myself down. I just sort of go away and it's just afterward there's just like this buzzing but what is, and I don't mean buzzing like in my head, I mean like radiant sort of but prickling I can't explain it but it's so joyous but I don't know what it is the physical okay uh, I term it that, differently that, I it, it makes perfect sense I don't know how to use the words you don't have to it's clear I what you say is the wrong samadhi <laughs> is the wrong samadhi. Wrong Sam samadhi samadhi is absorption and concentration uh -huh. one point okay okay but it comes to you when it doesn't have to, or when it shouldn't. So we say it's the wrong concentration, ah. the wrong samadhi, the wrong absorption. Ah. It's from your previous meditation karma or meditation practice. And what I said before is actually truly valid even now when okay. you finished it. Too much energy up in the head, ah. okay? So too much energy up in the head, that's dangerous ah. because it can fry a few fuses inside. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, watch out. <laughs> Too much energy up in the head, you can have very interesting visions first, oh. and a little headache or migraine next, mm. and some parts of the brain can get fried out. You're far from it, so don't worry. Mm. Because those who really push it up into the head, then they have this problem if it stays there for many weeks and months continuously. In Korean, it's called sanggi, yeah. rising chi. When we meditate, and I teach you a little technique. You can take this home with you, it's free. Okay? <laughs> so when you when you meditate and you really do open eyes, clear or half open eyes, you know, Zen with your Mahamudra on your Tanjuan, then the energy goes down on the front of the body into the Tanjuan and on the back it goes up. The Taoists call this microcosmic orbit. Okay? They took precious care that this orbit works correctly, okay? So when you meditate, then this energy circle really clears your consciousness, clears your senses. It puts you into a very relaxed and collected state. That, that's what we call correct focus. It's a mirror-like mind. But the way it works energetically is that it goes down here and goes up here. And it's a trade secret, but bows. 
they, they establish this circulation also. So when you bow, it's not just a sign of respect, it's an energy exercise too. Take it that way also, okay? You breathe correctly during bows, this thing happens. Breathe out when you go down and breathe in when you come up. Don't do it too fast, don't do it too slow, okay? Then this energy up in the head, or sanghi in Korean, mm -hmm. it totally clears out. And all these special visions and buzzes and lights and everything, especially the block of vision, that's very dangerous, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, in some Taoist books, there are accounts, uh, Taoist hermits going blind. They just lost control of their chi, mm -hmm. and just, boom, went up, and just went out like candles. Dangerous okay. driving sometimes. Uh, you, you really shouldn't drive at that time. I have to tell you. I just don't know when it's going to come on. All right. So. I'm later. sorry for interrupting. That's okay. You are not interrupting. You are bringing a very important meditation problem into yeah. the public attention, which yeah. is very much appreciated. <laughs> really, everybody learns from this. Okay, but later we can consult about the details of this. But what's really important, turn your microcosmic orbit, turn your energy flow back towards the tanjon, you know, in the front part of the body, and meditate in such a way that you stay awake, and all the energy is actually in the tanjon and below. Then, basically, there are, there are very good side effects. So your mind becomes clear, your energy becomes collected, and you don't have anything special, and that's good! All these special things are up in the head, okay? And some of these very strong special experiences, they are really damaging, and they're not necessary. So that's why in the old days in China they said, true dharma is no dharma. Okay? Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You. Ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your precious attention that you've been here, and we could share the dharma, you know, this morning. And I'm looking forward to meeting all of you again sometime, someplace, again, on this planet or elsewhere. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much.